Hello, this is Janet Smith, and I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Dallas, and I'm now doing the eighth in an eight-part series on sexual ethics. And today, I'm going to talk about conscience. Okay, you might say, well, how is conscience a, a topic that's particularly relevant to sexual ethics? And it's a good question. Uh, the point is, it's, it's relevant to all ethics, but it seems to come into play, particularly in sexual ethics, and particularly in, in the question I'm going to be addressing largely today, which is humane vitae and conscience. Conscience is a matter of natural law. Uh, again, I mentioned very early on in this series that there's many different ways of talking about natural law. That you can say a, a mandate of natural law is that you should do what is natural, always do what is natural. You could also say always do what is reasonable and rational. You could always say always do what your conscience, a well-formed conscience, tells you to do. And also you can all also say act in a loving way, that these are all synonymous dictates as far as natural law is concerned. Again, it would take some time to justify that claim. But the conscience is very much a part of natural law teaching. It's an internal faculty that we have that helps us determine what is rational, what is accord with natural law, what is God's will, what is the loving thing. And so it's a gut, an internal guide that we can consult to help us know what is right and what is wrong. Now again, I'd like to direct your attention to a few texts that might help you understand the um, conscience. A few of them are, are rather small documents, again, that you can get from the Daughters of St. Paul that were brought out largely to help th people think about uh, humane vitae and conscience. Mm -hmm. One was issued by the Canadian bishops, the Statement on the Formation of Conscience in 1974, which was less than 10 years after humane vitae came out. And a matter, as a matter of fact, this document is corrective uh, to some earlier teachings that the Canadian bishops had brought out on this topic. The Irish Episcopal Conference also has a wonderful little text called Conscience and Morality, published in 1980. Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger has a wonderful teaching called Conscience and the Truth that again is, is available from the Pope John Paul Center, or Pope John Center in Braintree, Massachusetts that I mentioned last time, a wonderful institute for the study of biomedical eth ethical issues in um, Braintree, Massachusetts. The Universal Catechism and Veritatis Splendor are superb sources for understanding the conscience. The conscience is a central part of John Paul II's teaching on morality, and especially in Veritatis Splendor, he talks about different erroneous views of conscience and a true view of conscience. Finally, in uh, Vatican II, there are two documents that are very helpful. One is the role of the church in the modern world, that's Gaudium et Spes, and the second is on religious liberty, or dignitatis humanae, which is also in the documents of Vatican II. I'll be citing from several of these documents as I read a text here on humanae vitae and conscience. Now, in many ways, the question of conscience has dominated the discussion surrounding humanae vitae. Much more than assessing whether contraception is good or bad, or analyzing how it harms relationships and society, theologians have largely focused on what they call the right to dissent, the right to follow one's own conscience in opposition to a church teaching. They no longer examine, as we have, the arguments why contraception is considered wrong by the church. They do not examine or reject the arguments that contraception is wrong because it poses so many th unnecessary risks to a woman's health, as I hope I've demonstrated, because it's damaging to male-female relationships, and because it damages one's relationship with God. No dissenting theologians have pondered in print what I looked at as the bad consequences of contraception, both for society and for marriage. Very few of them give any indication that they know the power of natural family planning to enhance marriages. And so most of the debate on contraception has not been on the issue itself. But most of the argument has been on the question if and when people have a right to dissent. At one time, dissenters concentrated largely on demonstrating that the church's condemnation of contraception was based on a physicalistic understanding of the sexual act. Again, I hope our past series has demonstrated that the church does not have a physicalistic understanding of the sexual act. That argument seems still to be their primary argument, but they also use their own dissent as an argument why the use of contraception is moral. They advance the curious claim that since most moral theologians dissent from humanae vitae, therefore contraception must be all right. That is, because dissenting the theologians dissent, Catholics in good, good conscience can contracept. It's a curious argument. Now, since most Catholics 
haven't thought through the arguments against contraception. As I said, most people have never heard a homily on contraception. They've never read a text about it. They've not been taught about it. They really haven't thought this through. And since most of them base their rejection on the church's teaching, either on the authority of dissenting theologians, and I amusingly, I hope, call this blind, dis blind disobedience, or they base it on their own vague sense that contraception makes sense, the claim that conscience rather than church authority should prevail becomes a crucial factor in the debate. I'll give you a little chart here, maybe to follow some of what I'm going to be talking about here. Now they tell us, studies show, that some 80% of Catholics contracept. And thus it seems, some people will claim, that Catholics are following their consciences rather than the magisterium of the church. That's 80%. As early as 1969, a major theologian named Giles Milhaven made the claim that Humanae Vitae was what he called a dead letter. Now, Humanae Vitae was issued in 1968, so this is only a year later that Giles Milhaven told us that there's no, really no need to pay any attention to Humanae Vitae. He said it was a dead letter because Catholics, he said, in good conscience, had decided that they could obey their own consciences and go against church teaching. In fact, in many high schools, there are textbooks that are used in sex education classes in which appears what I call a conscience clause. It generally follows the presentation of the church's teaching on contraception. The book will explain to some extent why the church teaches that contraception is wrong. But then it says, if you in good conscience cannot accept these arguments, you would be permitted to practice contraception. Now, it's fascinating that this conscience clause never appears in the section on racism or genocide or on social justice. The texts do not say that if your conscience tells you uh, that it's permissible to be a racist, that it's okay to be a, a racist. This conscience clause only appears in the section on contraception. That in itself is worth thinking about. Now, this invoking of the conscience as a way of getting out of living by the church's teaching on contraception was made legitimate in a way because of the statements made by various bishops' conferences when Humanae Vitae was issued. When Pope Paul VI put out Humanae Vitae, he asked the episcopacies around the world to issue statements in support of Humanae Vitae. And in fact, most of them did. Most of them issued statements of resounding support for Humanae Vitae. None of them outrightly denied the church's teaching, but some statements so qualified their support that it almost amounted to a denial. Uh, bishops' conferences in France, Austria, Canada, among other, in Canada, uh, among others, issued such qualified statements. In the Canadian statement, we could read, it is a fact that a certain number of Catholics, although admittedly subject to the teaching of the encyclical, find it either extremely difficult or impossible to make their own all elements of this doctrine. We must appreciate the difficulty experienced by contemporary man in understanding and appropriating some of the points of this encyclical. And we must make every effort to learn from the insights of Catholic scientists and intellectuals who are of undoubted loyalty to the Christian Church, the truth, and the, the authority of the Holy See. Since they are not denying any point of divine and Catholic faith, nor rejecting the teaching authority of the faith, faith these Catholics should not be considered or consider themselves shut off from the body of the faithful, but they should remember that their good faith will be dependent on a sincere self-examination to determine the true motives and grounds for such suspension of assent and on continued effort to consider and deepen their knowledge of the teaching of the church. That's the end of the statement. Again, this is a statement from the Canadian Bishops' Conference. It goes on to say, Counselors may meet others who, accepting the teaching of the Holy Father, find that because of particular circumstances, they are involved in what seems to them a clear conflict of duties, either each, either reconciling of conjugal love and responsible parenthood with the education of children already born or with the help of the mother. In accord with the accepted principles of moral theology, if these persons have tried sincerely but without success to pursue a line of conduct in keeping with the given directives, they may be safely assured that whoever honestly chooses that course which seems right to him does so in good conscience. 
Now, this is what I call the conscience clause. It says if you have a conflict of duties, all right, a conflict between doing right by your future babies or being right, doing right by the church and doing right by what you consider to be the, the duties of your marriage to have sexual intercourse, you can decide this independent of what the church teaches about contraception. Now, many modern theologians teach that in this situation where a Catholic thinks there's a conflict of duties, they can, in good conscience, decide to contracept. Now, I'm going to challenge this appeal to the conscience clause and the conflict of duty clause. And actually, I'm going to enlist in my repudiation the very Canadian bishops who issued that first statement. They issued another statement in 1974. It's truly one of the best brief statements one can get on conscience and serves as a repudiation of their earlier statement. The gist of that document is this, that a Catholic conscience properly formed actually cannot be in conflict with the church. That is, you can't really have a conflict of duties between what your church teaches you and what your conscience teaches you. If your conscience is properly formed, it will have to be in accord with the church teaching. That is, a properly formed Catholic conscience would accept the church's teaching on contraception. Now, this, is a, a next, this next claim is very important. The church teaches now and has always taught that you should always follow your conscience, all right? Always, always follow your conscience. Nothing else, your conscience. Now, we must always follow our conscience because the conscience is our highest internal guide to what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. In his Summa Theologica, St. Thomas Aquinas poses as a question, does an erroneous conscience bind? And that means that if your conscience is wrong, should you follow your conscience? And Thomas Aquinas says, yes, even when your conscience is wrong, you should follow it. You're obliged to follow it. Now, the irony, of course, here, very important thing to keep in mind, is that such an individual who has an erroneous conscience or whose conscience is wrong doesn't know that his or her conscience is wrong. Right? You can't say, I have a wrong conscience, but I'm going to follow it. Okay? You can't say, I know what's right and what is wrong, and I'm going to do what's wrong. Right? That's not a legitimate instance. That's not a legitimate instance of following an erroneous or wrong conscience. Aquinas is speaking of an erroneous conscience, when he speaks of an erroneous conscience, is speaking of someone who is subjectively innocent in having an erroneous conscience. This person doesn't know that his conscience is wrong. One mistakenly and unknowingly thinks that, that something which is right is wrong or the other way around. In this instance, when doing what one's erroneous conscience says to do, one is doing what one thinks to be right. So when we say you should follow your conscience, we should, we're saying you should always do what you think is right, oddly enough, even if what you think is right is wrong. But of course, you don't know <laughs> that what you think is right is wrong. Otherwise, you're not following your conscience. Now, as I mentioned in an earlier talk, it's likely that many Catholics are subjectively innocent in respect to the issue of contraception. Their consciences tell them that contraception is a moral act. Often in their marriage preparation classes, they have been taught that contraception is moral, and some may even have been told by their priests in a confessional that contraception is morally permissible, such as the state of the church today. They are subjectively innocent. They are rightly following an erroneous conscience, but they are still doing something wrong. Few understand what the job of the conscience is, or indeed, even what the conscience is. Now, I'm going to read a fairly lengthy passage from Gaudium et Spes, a document from Vatican II, usually translated, The Role of the Church in the Modern World. Now, this passage is wonderful. Listen closely. We'll analyze it carefully. It says, Deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Right? Deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Just depart from the text for a moment here. Now, where do we get this idea again that adultery is wrong or murder is wrong? Again, when we think about things, we, well, all of a sudden we discover that we have a very firm sense that something is right and something is wrong. You say, where do we get that? He says, we find that deep within ourselves, that we know we didn't make up this rule. We know it's not a rule that we made up. 
Well, we may get it by looking at the world around us. We say, but I didn't make up that law. That law exists independently of myself, even though I find it in myself and I feel that I must obey it. Let me read that line and continue again. Deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Its voice, ever calling him to love and to do what is good and avoid evil, its voice, ever calling him to love and to do what is good and avoid evil, tells him inwardly, at the right moment, do this, shun that. Okay, so your, guide, your conscience is a guide to action. It says, do this, avoid that. For man has in his heart a law inscribed by God. His dignity lies in observing this law, and by it he will be judged. His conscience is man's most secret core and his sanctuary. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in his depths. By conscience, in a wonderful way, that law is made known, which is fulfilled in the law of God and of one's neighbor. Through loyalty to conscience, Christians are joined to other men in the search for truth and the right solutions to so many modern problems which arise both in the life of individuals and from social relationships. It's a very interesting claim there, that our consciences unite us to other people. And everybody's conscience should say adultery is wrong, and everybody's conscience should sh say that murder is wrong. It's a way in which we are listening to God's law, and it's also a way in which we are united with our neighbors. This passage goes on to say, hence, the more a correct conscience prevails, the more do persons and groups turn aside from blind choice and try to be guided by objective standards of moral conduct. Now, this is very important. On the one hand, it seems that the conscience is extremely subjective. It's something very internal. It's inside of you. It's yours. On the other hand, it needs to be guided by objective standards of moral conduct. So the conscience is both very subjective, meaning it's internal to you, but it's also it's required that it be guided not by your own subjective desires, but it must be guided by objective standards of moral conduct. It goes on to say, yet it often happens that conscience goes astray through ignorance, which it is unable to avoid without thereby losing its dignity. I'll comment on this one in a moment, but let me reread it. It often happens that conscience goes astray through ignorance, which it is unable to avoid without thereby losing its dignity. This cannot be said of the man who takes little trouble to find out what is true or good, or when conscience by degrees is almost blinded through the habit of committing sin. Important points here. If your conscience is ignorant and you're still following your conscience, you don't sin. If you're ignorant through no fault of your own. But if you take little trouble to find out what is good, or if your conscience is blinded by the habit of sin, then you are culpable for the bad acts that you do. All right, that's the end of that passage. Now this long and extremely good passage deserves a good deal of analysis. But before we complete that analysis, let us consider how some people speak of the conscience. For instance, some people say, someone might say, my conscience doesn't bother me. Yes, I took some things from work. I brought home some envelopes and some rubber bands and pens, but my conscience doesn't bother me. After all, my boss doesn't pay me enough. These are little perks that I deserve. My conscience doesn't bother me. Now, this does not mean that this person has a clear conscience. Just because his conscience doesn't bother him doesn't mean that he has a clear or good conscience. People often think that if they don't feel guilty, or that is too guilty, then they have acted in good conscience. If I don't feel guilty about something, then sometimes I think, well, my conscience doesn't bother me. I must have consulted my conscience, and I must have done all right. But the fact is, these people, and myself and sometimes, most likely have never even consulted their conscience. In fact, many people do not regularly consult their conscience. They, ask, they act all the time. They do things all the time, but it's not that they've really consulted their conscience. They simply do what is convenient and what will help them achieve their ends. They don't really think about, was what I did right or wrong? And if they do, they think about it in a very quick fashion and sort of console themselves and rationalize and move on. Well, yeah, OK, I took some stuff. OK, well, you know, I, I, I pocketed that extra change. Uh, well, do you think about it? 
Do you really think about whether you, what you did was right or wrong, whether it's really good action? To consult one's conscience, to act in accord one's, with one's conscience, means to reflect. You have to think about it. You have to say, is what I am about to do right or wrong? Is it morally justifiable? Is it in accord with God's will? Many think that just because they don't have an overwhelming sense of guilt about what they are about to do or have done, then the act must be in accord with our conscience. And I'd ask this about contraceptives. How many contraceptives have really sat down and thought about it? Is this right or is this wrong? Right? Is it in accord with God's will? Or aren't most people just sort of doing it because they don't feel bad about it? It doesn't bother them. Right? The passage that I cited from Gaudium et Spes says that we all have an internal voice that we should be consulting. It says that he is alone with God whose voice echoes in his depths. This internal voice is the voice of God speaking. It lays down within one a law that says what is good and what is bad. Now some people might ask, well, if we have this voice within us, how is it, if we've got this sanctuary, if we have this inner core where we can speak with God, how is it that so many people can do so many bad things? Now again, we have to keep in mind that we don't always try to find that conscience, right? We often act without any reference to right and wrong. We just do what we want to do. If, we, if it seems right to tell a lie to get us out of a situation, we'll do it. We don't really think about whether it's morally good or bad. It's, boy, but I can, I can save myself a lot of trouble if I tell this lie. We have to keep in mind that there's not just one voice inside of us, not just the voice of God, but there's lots of other voices that resonate inside of us. And it's not always easy to hear God's voice in what I call this din inside of us. There are the voices of our passions, the voices of our culture, and of our habits. Probably very few of us sit down and try to distinguish God's voice in that cacophony, the cacophony of voices that we find inside of us. I find this a very interesting philosophical point, that we have these different voices inside of us. Right? Eat that piece of chocolate. Don't eat that piece of chocolate. Right? Go out with this woman. Talk to that man. Don't talk to that man. All these different voices inside of us that sort of tell us what to do and tell us what not to do. And how do we decide which one of those voices we ought to listen to? Which one of those voices goes along with what is really right and really wrong? So, consulting the conscience then does not just mean consulting one's feelings or opinions or what one feels good about or what one will feel bad about. The primary question one has to ask is, what does God want me to do? What is God's will in this situation? Our conscience is our access to God. It is where he speaks to us. We need to be listening to the voice inside of us that is God's voice, all right? And not the voice of our passion, and not the voice of our parents, and not the voice of our culture, but we need to find God's voice inside of us. Now this passage, the passage I read from Gaudium et Spes, mentioned several things that can obscure the voice of God in the conscience. One is ignorance, right? You might be ignorant of what you ought to do. One, but one is obliged to acquire all the relevant facts in order to make a good judgment. I mean, you might not know everything you need to know, and then you would not be at fault for some wrong action that you've done. And again, I think many Catholics have been given false information about contraception, and so they are not at moral fault for what they have done. On the other hand, one is obliged to acquire all the relevant facts in order to make a good judgment. I remember when I was first teaching Humanae Vitae to a class of students, and I asked them, how many of you, I said, think contraception is morally permissible? And all their hands went up. And I said, well, how many of you have read Humanae Vitae? No hands went up. And I said, well, what makes you think that you can have an opinion on whether contraception is right or wrong if you haven't read what the church teaches? Now, these were sophomores in college, and you can't expect sophomores in college to, read, to have read all the church documents. But you might hope that, at least in the course of their studies, they will have read it. And you might hope that, in the course of teaching them, you might get them to be humble enough to think that, you know, maybe I should read what the church teaches. Maybe the church has something to say to me about this. Maybe I shouldn't be listening only to the voices of my culture, only to the voices of my passions, but I also should be listening to the voice of the church. So we need to get the facts, we need to get the, the, the arguments, we need to get the full information before we can make any judgment that is truly following our conscience. If we do not present our interior voice with the full and proper facts, it cannot speak truthfully to us. 
If we have access to the facts but don't bother to get them, then we are responsible for the bad judgments that we make. Willed ignorance or ignorance due to negligence is no excuse. If a doctor doesn't read his patient's chart that notes that the patient is allergic to penicillin, and then he goes ahead and prescribes penicillin, no one's going to care much later that he says, I didn't know the patient was allergic to penicillin. I'm not wrong. I was acting in accord with the full knowledge that I had. We say, oh, excuse me, no, you were supposed to have the knowledge of reading the chart. You've been negligent. You are still wrong, even though you acted in so-called good conscience. It wasn't a good conscience because you didn't get all the information. Now, it seems to me, and I'll make this point as we go along, that Catholics have an obligation to learn what their church, church teaches about any action that is important and about which the church has some teaching that we could consult. But if one has no responsibility for knowing the facts, then one is subjectively innocent of any wrongdoing. For instance, I think many of, young, of the young teenage girls who get abortions are subjectively innocent, okay? I've worked with some of these girls, and they've been pushed into the abortion by their teachers or by their mothers, right? And they've been told that it's, per, it's just a, a, a mass of tissue, and it would be all right just to, to remove this mass of tissue from their wombs. Now, it's, it's not, for a 14-year-old, for a 14-year-old who says, I'm going to do what my mother tells me, I'm going to do what my guidance counselor tells me, that's probably the best they can do, right? We have to admire a child who is obedient, right? Even when they're obedient to someone who is wrong. Now, this girl may sit down and ponder, what does God want me to do? But she says, I don't know. How can I know? I'm only 14. I'm going to do what my mother tells me to do. She knows more than I. Now, this girl does not have all the facts about prenatal life, and she may know nothing about the sacredness of life. Her mother doesn't tell her, her teachers don't tell her, her counselors don't tell her. In this case, again, her abortion might be an act of humble obedience. Now, such a girl would be subjectively innocent of what she's done. What she's done is still objectively evil, it's still intrinsically evil, it's still very bad, but she is not sub subjectively culpable for her act. On the other hand, Consider a young woman who does have access to full information but doesn't want it. I've worked with these as well. They come into a pregnancy help center simply for the free pregnancy test, and they refuse to look at any of the material concerning the development of the fetus. Now, such women have been known to have said, I'm determined to get an abortion, and I don't want to be talked out of it. I know if I looked at that film, I know if I looked at those pamphlets, you might convince me not to have an abortion. I'm determined to get an abortion. I don't want to look at these. Now, this woman is deliberately putting aside information that she ought to have in order to make a good decision. She may be ignorant of what she's about to do, but she's culpably ignorant for what she's about to do. Now, the passage from Gaudium et Spes also speaks about this person who takes little trouble to find out what is true or good and talks about a, a, a person who, who takes little trouble because his conscience is by degrees almost blinded through the habit of committing sin. It's a very interesting phrase. Your conscience is by degrees almost blinded through the habit of committing sin. Now, habit can falsify the deliberations of an individual. It would be, for instance, a very rare conscience that wouldn't know that adultery is wrong. Most people know adultery is wrong. Very few people are confused. Many people are confused about whether abortion is right or wrong. They're confused about whether contraception is right or wrong. But not many people are confused about rape or adultery or these actions. Even those who commit them are not unclear about whether they're right or wrong. But if one has been an habitual adulterer, he or she is unlikely to hear the voice of God about adultery. Adulteries have put that voice out of their mind, probably through a process of rationalization. They try to convince themselves that what they are doing is not really adultery, that there is no point in being faithful to their spouse. Well, we're not really married. We're married in name only. She's un unfaithful to me. I'm not really committing adultery because we're not, we don't have a really good marriage, whatever. Um, the adulterous individual says something like, I feel good about having sex with my mistress. It seems right to me. I love her. She loves me. My wife is unresponsive, etc." This habit of sin has ob obscured or crippled the individual's ability to consult his conscience. But the chances are, again, if he sat down in a room and really sat there and thought about it and said, and what is what I'm doing right or wrong? Is this God's will or not God's will? He could find the voice within him that says that adultery is wrong. He's just trying to, he's trying to shut it out with a whole bunch of rationalizations. Right? That voice is there, but it can be, the document says it can almost be obscured by the habit of committing sin.
but it doesn't mean it can be completely obscured, which means that those who sit in their room or get down on their knees and say to God, tell me what you want me to do, they will hear God's voice, even though they've had bad habits, if they really try to listen, and that's the key. Again, consulting one's conscience is not simply a matter of asking, do I feel guilty or do I not feel guilty? Have I decided what seems to me to be right or wrong? We have to make certain that it's the voice of God we're listening to when we consult our conscience. We must make certain that we've gotten the full information about whatever it is we're proposing to do so that we can make a true and honest evaluation and God can speak with us about the situation we're in and not some other situation for which we don't have the facts. Now, for a Catholic, the simple consulting of the conscience is not enough to ensure a good judgment. The conscience is our highest interior guide, but it's not our highest guide, absolutely speaking. It's our highest interior guide, but it's not our highest guide. It's not our only guide, and again, it's not the highest guide that we have. The conscience, of course, is not infallible. That's pretty clear. It can make mistakes, as we have noted, when influenced by such things as ignorance or bad habits. Some of us even know that we don't know all we should to be able to make good moral decisions. Catholics, but Catholics have the great gift of the church that helps us to make certain that our conscience is on the right road. Again, I talked about this with the reproductive technologies. Some of them sound really good, right? Gee, you're gonna help a woman who is infertile have a baby. It sounds really good. How am I, little old me, supposed to decide whether this is right or wrong? Well, the church helps, right? The church has thought about these things in accord with certain principles for centuries. Okay, now my conscience might tell me that it's okay to cheat my employer, or my conscience might tell me that adultery is okay, but a Catholic really knows better. A Catholic should reason, my church says that these things are wrong. And my church has even a more direct contact with the Holy Spirit and God and a greater guarantee than I've got. Sure, God speaks to me. He speaks to me through the Holy Spirit in my conscience. But I could not be hearing this because I've got so many bad habits and because I don't have enough facts and I haven't been well trained. And maybe I can't hear that voice of God within me. So if my conscience tells me that something is right, that, I, that my church tells me is wrong, I feel extremely uncomfortable about that. I should think, isn't it likely that I'm the one that's wrong, that I'm not reasoning correctly, or that I am being misled by some passion or bad habit? If the Holy Spirit guides the church, then why should we trust what seems to be the voice of our conscience over the church? Why should we think that what seems to be our conscience is right over the church, which has a greater guarantee of divine guidance than we as individuals have? Okay. Very good question. Okay find ourselves, suppose I think, I, you know, I don't see why I have to pay a fair wage. I could get away with paying these people two fifty dollars an hour. Why would I have to pay them more? I can get away with it. My conscience doesn't bother me. These people are lucky to have a job. They think, well, no, the, the church tells us I have to pay a just wage and a fair wage. So it's better take a look at the church. Better pay attention to the church and listen to it and help make let it form my conscience. Let it give me the principles on which to think about this because it's much more likely that it's right than that I am. In their statement on conscience in 1974, the Canadian bishops clearly teach that Catholics should follow what their church teaches. That statement says, it's a quotation, a believer has the absolute obligation of conforming his conduct first and foremost to what the church teaches because first and foremost for the believer is the fact that Christ, through his spirit, is ever present in his church, and the whole church to be sure, but particularly with those who exercise services within the church and for the church, the first of which services is the apostles. Okay? This is very important. You say, well, some people want to say, well, the people are the church. Okay, the people are the church. And the people seem to want think that contraception is okay. Most people are contracepting. So since most people contracept, the people are the church, it would seem that contraception is okay because they're the church. <laughs> this passage is saying, wait, wait a second. No, the church is a guide, but we have to look at those who exercise certain services in the church, and those services are the services of the apostles, by which he means, of course, the pope and the bishops, the magisterium of the church, the teaching authority of the church. Again, I mentioned that the church throughout the history of its existence has taught that contraception is wrong. 
And why should it be that a particular group of people in a particular time in history who seem to think that this act is important should override the teaching of the whole of the bishops and the popes throughout history? As a matter of fact, the bishops and the pope now uh, teach this. So what you're doing is you're pitting the people against this whole tradition of the church. Now this conflict that some people talk about between the church and the conscience should never really exist. An apparent conflict should be easy to resolve. If the church says one thing and, and my, what seems to be my conscience says another, it's the church that has the right to form my conscience more than anything else, more than my opinions, more than what other people are telling me, more than what the media tells me. It's again the church that I should yield to. Church tells me that abortion's wrong. It doesn't matter if the National Organization of Women says it right. it's right. It doesn't matter if the U.S. Congress says it's right. It doesn't matter if the Supreme Court says it's right. It doesn't matter if my whole culture tells me it's right. It doesn't matter if I think it's right, right? If my church tells me it's wrong, I should say, well, the church is guided by the Holy Spirit in a very clear and direct way throughout the history. Again, I too have guidance by the Holy Spirit, but I can get confused in hearing that voice. There's more than one voice that speaks to me of the Holy Spirit, from the Holy Spirit. One is inside of me, and one is through the church. Now, the, dis the dissenting Catholic seems to be in a position of tremendous tension within the church. For instance, wouldn't it be very awkward to belong to a church that one believes to be teaching false things about morality? Why should one have a devotion to a church if one thinks it is wrong about something that our in our society is so clearly important? It seems to me that a situation of dissent creates an intolerable tension for the devout Catholic. Again, if I really believe that the church speaks for Christ, but I really believe that abortion or contraception or adultery are right, then I think, oh my gosh, there's something wrong here. The church is not listening to Christ because this is the truth. And then you've got a problem. Why should I be committed to this church if this church is so wrong about something that I know is right? You know, what's truly sad is that few Catholics realize that the church does speak for the Holy Spirit. They don't realize that to follow what seems to be their conscience against the church puts them in an extreme state of tension with God. That's how uninformed most of us are about what our church is. We don't realize that we've got a big tension here. We're quite comfortable in contracepting and going to church and saying, I'm a good Catholic. I give to church every Sunday. I send my kids to the Catholic school. I serve on the church council. I bake cookies for the bazaar. Who's to say I'm not a good Catholic? My conscience doesn't bother me. What's the problem? Again, they have no idea that, practically speaking, there is an enormous tension between what they're doing in their lives and their beliefs as Catholics. They don't sense that tension because they don't know enough about either contraception, their conscience, or in fact about the church. Catholics are working in a fairly large vacuum, and they feel fairly comfortable there. Now, the new encyclical, Very Taught to Splendor, or Splendor of the Truth, makes it clear that it is not the part of the conscience to decide what is right and what is wrong in principle in regard to norms and in regard to laws. The conscience cannot decide that adultery is wrong. It can only discover what is right or what is wrong. It is the job of the conscience not to make the laws but to discover them. Where we have freedom of conscience is in applying the norms that we have discovered. Okay? For instance, as we have just noted, the conscience can't really decide that adultery is moral, right? My conscience can't say, yeah, well, church is wrong, adultery is okay. Church is wrong, abortion is okay. They're not, they're wrong. We can't make the decision that they're right. That's the truth that lies outside the province of the conscience. Every true conscience would recognize that adultery is immoral. The job of the conscience, though, is to determine one's own behavior. Okay, sometimes it might be difficult to decide what's going on whether a lie is really wrong or whether it's a justifiable deception. If you tell some Nazis that there's not any Jews in your basement when you've got 10 in your basement, is that really a lie that's against God's will or is that justifiable deception, right? If you deceive your boss about who did this bad job, if you're protecting someone else, is this wrong or is this right? You know deception is wrong, you know lying is wrong, but is this is this one of those instances that's wrong? Again, the conscience, the church can't make a decision for us of all those particular instances. We have to do it in accord with our own consciences.
Again, I've, I've given this example earlier when I was talking about uh, prudence. When you talk about everybody knows that conscience is wrong, but you take two men who are out of town on a week or three week venture. They're on the job, right? And they walk again by a bar and they see an attractive woman there. They say, should I talk with this attractive woman or not? I know her, she's a colleague. Now one man might say, Phew, no way. Adultery is wrong, I know it's wrong. This would be an occasion of sin. I could, too easily this could lead to something I shouldn't lead to. I'm going straight to my room. Another man might say, oh, I'm so delighted she's there. We have business to talk about. She's very attractive. We'll have a few drinks. It'll be a nice evening. I fear not at all being faithful, fa um, unfaithful to my wife, right? He might be absolutely right. There's no occasion of sin here for him. Both men know adultery is wrong, but it, they have to decide what is the right behavior for them in this situation. Right? The church can't tell us, don't have attractive, don't have drinks with attractive women in bars. Okay, it can't give us that kind of rule. It can't say, it's okay to have drinks with attractive women in bars if blah, blah, blah. It can't give us that kind of rule. It's, it's our conscience that has to decide when this is morally permissible and when this is not. As far as contraception is concerned, again, the conscience can't decide that contraception is right or wrong. The church tells us it is wrong by natural law. It's something we discover, not something we decide. But we can decide, and we must decide, no one can decide for us when it's right to use natural family planning. The church can't tell us, well, if you, you can't use natural family planning until you've had three children, or you can't use natural family planning unless this or unless that. No, it's your particular situation that you have to be attentive to to determine when it's moral to do something or when it's not. Okay. Now, if anyone has any confusion about moral norms, again, one should look to the church. Again, if we're confused about reproductive technologies or anything else, we have to go to the church and try to find out whether or not the church can guide us in these matters. Now, some people think that if their conscience is what we call invincibly ignorant, right, meaning they're ignorant and it's not their fault that they're ignorant, or that they're subjectively innocent, that no harm can come to them. They may even wish that they were ignorant about the morality of these actions. They might say, well, gee, I wish I didn't know that sterilization was wrong because I'd like to be sterilized. Uh, and gee, I wish I didn't know it. I wish I didn't know what the church teaching was because then I'd have the best of all possible worlds. I could get sterilized and I'd be subjectively innocent and I'd be fine. But the point is, if sterilization, if contraception, if abortion, if adultery are truly against human nature, if they're truly against the human good, it's, your subjective innocence isn't going to protect you from the harm that comes with these actions, right? Subjective innocence does not protect you from the harm that comes from your action. It does protect you from moral guilt. It does protect you from that. You will not be punished for these de deeds in, 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 the, in, the after li in life everlasting, but you will suffer harm here from them. If a 14-year-old gets an abortion she, and she doesn't know that it's wrong, she is still going to suffer the bad consequences of abortion. In fact, ster sterilization itself is a good example of this principle. There are many who deal with couples who, um, they, they deal with couples in a pastoral situation and they, f that, and they find out that um, sterilization can be very damaging to marriages. Couple get, couples get sterilized, they think, well, this will be great. Uh, now we can have sex again without any fear of babies showing up, babies that we don't want to have. They say this will greatly improve our relationship to have this baby-free sex. But a lot of couples find out that after they, they're sterilized, they, certain, they find a certain flatness to their sex lives, all right? They find that there's a certain flatness and blandness that they didn't really experience before. And they're troubled by guilt. They're troubled that there's something wrong, all right? There's something not here that should be here. And even if they didn't mean to do anything damaging, even if they were subjectively innocent of what they were doing, they still may suffer the bad consequences uh, from it. Now it's the same again with contraception. Although, although many people contracept innocently, they still suffer the bad consequences. I want to tell an anecdote that one of my friends told me. She comes from a, a family of eight. They were all raised Catholic, though there's only two in the family that are still really practicing in, in any sort of regular way. Their, their Catholicism, they get their children baptized and this sort of thing, but they're the others when they have children. In fact, they don't. There are eight of them. They're just starting to have children, but at the time of this anecdote, they didn't. Of the eight, six were contracepting, right? One was unmarried, and one was using natural family planning. Now, one day, this, these, this family was having a very 
open and candid discussion of their sex lives. Right? Now, these six that were contracepting, they're all very attractive, young people. They all, husband and wife both have jobs, yuppies, if you will. They both have everything that they want. They're all using contraception. The couple using natural family planning, only the husband works. They have four children. Things are a little tight around the household. Now, all the women who are contracepting, let's go with the men first. All the men in the contraceptive relationships were saying that they had been forced to beg for sex. That's what they felt, that largely they were forced to beg for sex, and they found this very demeaning, right? They felt that they were ga engaging in a sexual act with a woman who just wasn't all that interested, right? And the women were complaining. They felt that they were, felt like sex objects. They felt that they worked all day, and then they came home at night, and um, then they were expected to have sex, and that was just one more job they had to do during the day. Now, the couple using natural family planning were very quizzical. They were sort of looking at each other and saying, what are they talking about? Our sex life is just fine. We enjoy it. A lot of zest, a lot of fun. What are they talking about? Now, if anybody's looking at these couples, the six who, who contracept, beautiful, go to fitness clubs, have money to go out to romantic meals, go to Cac Cancun for the weekend, a couple using NFP, they're getting a little pudgy, gray, they don't sleep well, you know, they got tacky toys all over the place. You say, now, which couples are likely to have the vibrant sexual life? And many people would be surprised, of course, to find out that the couple using natural family planning is a couple that's having a very good sexual life. And the couples who are using contraception, who you think would have all the exterior, exterior circumstances that make for good sexual life, that they're having the bad one. But the point is that acts have consequences. And even though these six couples might be, con might be subjectively innocent of what was going on with them, even though they might not be guilty for having contraceptive, they are all still suffering the bad consequences of their act. And the couple who's using natural family planning are suffering the good consequences of their faithful act. So the point again is that if couples are doing something that is objectively wrong, even if they don't know that it's objectively wrong, they can experience the bad consequences of that act. Okay. Now, Let's move to another question. Let's move to the question of the infallibility of humani vitae. Okay? Some people say, I don't have to follow humani vitae because it's not an infallible teaching. Right? And some people make this mistake. They think that if it's, not, if it's a non-infallible teaching, that it must indeed be fallible, and even think that it must be wrong. Okay? They lose sight of the fact that something could be non-infallible, something could have been pronounced in an infallible fashion, not pronounced in an infallible fashion, and still be absolutely true. Okay? The church can still speak truthfully about things, even though it doesn't speak infallibly about these things. Now, when it, it seems more sensible to assume that something that's non-infallible isn't necessarily or even likely wrong if the church teaches it. All right? It's likely that the what the church teaches is true, whether it teaches it infallibly or non-infallibly. Now, there's a real question about whether or not Humani Vitae, as a document, has the status of infallibility, but whether or not it could still, even though as a document it wasn't written to deliver an inf to be an infallible document, that it still delivers a teaching that's infallible nonetheless. Now, we have to keep in mind that there's more than one way for the church to teach infallibly. And we also have to keep in mind that the, the Catholic is supposed to be obedient to a church, its church even when it's not teaching infallibly. But here the question is, does the church teach infallibly about this topic? Okay, the church does not teach infallibly only through documents that have the official mark of infallibility. Something is given the official or explicit mark of infallibility when the Pope speaks what is called ex cathedra. Okay, that means from the chair, from the chair of Peter. And popes have done this only twice in the history of the church. There's only two doctrines that have been formally ex cathedra uh, pronounced infallibly. And both of them are Marian doctrines. One was proclaiming that Mary was bodily assumed into heaven. And the second was that Mary was immaculately conceived. Right? Now technically, properly, these are the only two things that have been proclaimed infallible by an ex cathedra statement. But there are other ways for the church to teach infallibly 
and that is through, one is through the, the, the ordinary magisterium, the ordinary magisterium. In the document of Vatican II entitled Lumen Gentium, or On the Church, section 25 states, bishops who teach in communion with the Roman pontiff are to be revered by all as witnesses to the divine and Catholic truth. The faithful for their part are obliged to submit to their bishop's decision made in the name of Christ in matters of faith and morals and to adhere to it with a ready and respectful allegiance of mind. The loyal submission of the will and intellect must be given in a special way to the authentic teaching of the Roman pontiff even when he does not speak ex cathedra. In such wise, indeed, that his supreme teaching authority be acknowledged with respect and sincere assent be given to decisions made by him conformably with his manifest mind and intention, which is made known principally either by the character of the documents in question or by the frequency with which a certain doctrine is proposed or by the manner in which the doctrine is formulated. Now, as I just try to point out a little bit here, there are three ways, according to this passage, that we could know a teaching to be infallible. One, it depends on the character of the doc document, it depends on the frequency of the teaching, and it depends on the manner in which the doctrine is formulated. Now, what is the status of the Church's teaching on contraception? Does it meet the test of infallibility sketched in the above passage? In his book, Contraception, written in 1964, a little before Humanae Vitae, John Noonan, I mentioned this book before, a book titled Contraception, he reviews the Church's teaching on contraception. In the introduction, he says very, very clearly that the Church has been constant in its condemnation of contraception. From its very earliest days, the Church has been against contraception. He himself judges that the teaching has all the marks of infallibility and this in spite of the fact that he openly admits that he wrote his book with the ho hopes that the church would change its teaching. What the dissenters rarely acknowledge is that the church teaches with no less authority on contraception than it does on other moral issues, such as abortion. There are, in fact, no encyclicals on abortion, but we know abortion is wrong, and we know the church can't be wrong about that. Yet we have many encyclicals and papal documents on contraception. Casti Canubi, Humani Vitae, Familiaris Consortio, Gaudium et Spes, Veritatis Splendor, now Evangelium Vitae, it just goes on and on, right? The Church's condemnation of contraception occurs more frequently than ever before. Pope John Paul II does not miss an opportunity to, re to reiterate and explain the Church's teaching. So if anybody can read the signs of the times, the weather vane is not indicating that there is any loosening up on the Church's teaching on contraception. Rather, we've become more confident, we've become clear, we have a deeper understanding of why contraception is wrong. Thus, the Church's teaching on contraception seems to fit the criteria of something taught infallibly by virtue of the ordinary magisterium because it is being taught so frequently and forcibly. Does the teaching fit the criteria of the manner in which the document is, do doctrine is formulated. In Humani Vitae section 18 we read, it is possible to predict that perhaps not everyone will be able to accept a teaching of this sort easily. After all, there are so many critical voices broadcast widely by means of modern communication that are contra contrary to the voice of the church. Therefore, it is not surprising that the church finds herself a sign of contradiction just as was Christ her founder. But this is no reason for the church to abandon her duty entrusted to her in preaching the whole moral law firmly and humbly, both the natural law and the law of the gospel. Since the church did not make either of these laws, she cannot change them. She can only be their guardian and interpreter. Thus, it would never be right for her to declare as morally permissible that which is truly not so, for what is moral is by its very nature always opposed to the true good of man. Very important line. Since the church did not make these laws, she cannot change them. She did not make the natural law, and she did not make the law of the gospel, and she didn't, since she didn't make them, she can't change them. She can only be their guardian and interpreter. And this is what the church is saying, that 
that this teaching on contraception the church believes to be a teaching that is in accord with God's will from the natural law. It's not just the church's teaching as a matter of discipline. The church is saying it can't overturn its teaching on contraception any more than, than it can overturn its teaching on adultery. It's not a decision that the church has made. It's a discovery that the church has made through the different vehicles given to us, through natural law and through scripture. So I think it's quite clear that the church's teaching on contraception likely fits the guidelines for what is an infallible teaching. In fact, those who say it's not infallible are the ones who are fallible, and they are probably even wrong. Okay? So if the condemnation of contraception is a true teaching, how could our conscience be right to say that contraception is right? That's much again like our conscience telling us that abortion is right or telling us that adultery is right. If it does tell us this, these things, it's because of ignorance or because of negligence or bad habits. But it's not truly the voice of God speaking within us. It's some other voice that she's confusing with her conscience that's telling her, he or she, that's telling he or she that abortion is moral. It's likely some other voice than the voice of God that's telling couples that it's moral to contracept. Thank you.